All right, we'll do a quick example uh, with principal stresses and then try to explain a little bit about how this makes sense. I know that uh, stress transformations seem weird, right? How can we just go from having uh, a bunch of normal stresses to having just sheer stresses? Um, and so we'll try to get our heads around that a little bit. So we're going to start uh, with a simple example. Uh, column under axial loading only has tensile loading. Okay, so we're going to find our principal stresses, our maximum in place, uh, in plane shear stress, um, and associated average normal stress. So this seems like uh, uh, almost too easy example, right? All we have here is a normal stress. So my three unique vectors are sigma zero. I don't have any stress in this direction and zero shear stress. So we can write using our sign conventions. I have a, a positive tensile stress in the x direction and then zero stresses. Finding our principal stresses is in fact trivial because this tells me here that I'm already at my principal axes. So my principal axes in this problem are actually along the axis of, um, of my rod and uh, up and down uh, along the radius. So we can write that our sigma max is sigma, right, is this uh, stress in the axial direction. My sigma minimum is zero, okay? What does that mean? It means that nowhere in this rod are there compressive stresses, right? Nowhere can I find a stress that is negative uh, a normal stress that's negative. So no matter what my orientation, there aren't going to be any compressive stresses. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Now we know our principal axes, right? They're going to be along the axis and up and down here. Uh, we know our maximum normal stress, our minimum normal stress. Now we want to turn to our shear stress. And it seems like that should be pretty trivial too, right? We don't have any shear stress, uh, but that's where things get tricky. Um, do we have shear stress? We do if we change our orientation, okay? There's no shear stress for this element right here, this square here, but if we change its orientation, it's gonna have some shear stress, okay? We know that a maximum shear stress uh, is, occurs 45 degrees away uh, from our principal planes, and so we can calculate that magnitude. And we go back to our equation uh, from the last uh, mini lecture, uh, and we can find that our sh maximum shear stress is sigma over two. Uh, and we know that the normal stress there is gonna be our average stress, so that's sigma plus zero, right, um, over two. So we're gonna have sigma over two as our, uh, as our normal stress as well. And we get this uh, element. So here you can see our normal stresses, our sigma over two, and our in-plane maximum stresses, going this way and that way, are also sigma over two. So we do have shear stress here. Now, what does this mean uh, in practice? Well, it makes a difference uh, in terms of how we think about um, designing something. So if I have a brittle material like cast iron, uh, it's got a weak resistance uh, to normal stress. So it, it, that brittle material is gonna break when I have a large normal stress. Um, and so if we look at this piece here, here's a piece of cast iron that's been, uh, that's failed. Um, it fails along that principal axis, roughly, right? Um, it fails because those normal stresses, those tensile stresses are strong. So in, in, if we have cast iron, we wanna pay particular attention to those normal stresses. But a ductile material, that is a material that will stretch a little bit, and we'll talk about that as uh, coming up, um, like a mild steel 
fails more often due to shear stress uh, because of the way that the crystal structure of that metal works. Um, and so in designing with a mild steel, we want to pay attention to a shear stress. So we'd look at this diagram and say, oh, I do have a shear stress here. Um, and that shear stress acts at a 45 degree angle. And so when we look at um, a failed example here, we can see, <laughs> trying to convince us that this is actually 45, it's, it's not... Um, it's not going to line up like that because the mechanics here are more complicated, but you can see that it's stretching in that way, right? That the, that the stresses along that 45 degree angle are the stresses that are actually causing the failure here. It's not breaking uh, in the same way that this cast iron is breaking. Um, and so if we were dealing with this and thought there was only a normal stress here, we would think that this would withstand a much higher load uh, than if we recognize that it's uh, there are some shear stresses in a particular uh, orientation. So this is where uh, things get tricky. So let's see if we can figure this out. How is it that if I just pull on that bar in two different directions, how do I get shear stress when everything seems to be tensile stress? Everything seems to be a, a tensile resultant force. Uh, well, the first thing is, is not to associate shear stress with rotation. It may um, create a sort of tendency to rotate, right? We think of torque uh, creating a tendency to rotate here. Um, but what shear stress is doing in equilibrium is not creating any rotation. It's creating a deformation. It's going to kind of pinch um, an element, and we'll talk more about that uh, in future lectures too. Uh, but we have to remember that complementary property of shear, right? These elements here that are causing rotation, they have to be equal to each other, right? This one is causing counterclockwise, that's counterclockwise, this is causing clockwise, this is causing clockwise. So there's no rotation here because we're at equilibrium. Um, and those shears are going to be roughly, um, well, in total, they are going to be equal to each other. Um, even in magnitude wise, they're all going to be very similar to each other as well. And so a shear stress is pinching an element, but not rotating it. But then you might say, well, how can we have one element that's being pinched, right? And then we, the same element there, um, in a different orientation is just being stretched or compressed, right? We still have a problem. How can you have an um, uh, element in the same state of stress that's reacting in a different way? So let's look at a couple of other images. So consider that example before. Again, here we have just a tensile stress on uh, this element. And the tendency for that tensile stress is going to be to stretch our element in this way. So the dotted uh, line here is what happens afterwards, after we've applied our load. That makes good sense to us, right? Um, it's going to, a force in that direction is going to pull that element and try to extend it in that direction. When we rotate that coordinate system, that tensile force is going to stay the same. Um, so if we look down here, we see a tensile force acting the same green arrows here. But what it's doing is uh, it's creating an element that responds in a different way, right? Um, the element along the horizontal axis is now deforming this diagonally. It's pinching it. Right, that's what we mean by when I said pinching before. Um, and so we have not a change in our physical situation. We still have the same forces being applied. All we did was rotate our box. And in this one, we don't have any shear forces. This one we do. This one, we have tensile elongation. Here we have shear pinching. Um, and so, that's the key idea, is same physical situation, 
Same size element, same material, same force, but when we change our orientation, uh, we get um, a different description of that physical situation.